My sermon today is called The Secret Place. The first text I'm going to read from is found in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 20 and 21. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For, behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Isaiah 26, verse 20 and 21. Let us read this in connection with the next scripture, Exodus chapter 12, verse 20 and 23. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Exodus chapter 12, verse 22 and 23. Notice here, first, a duty enjoined, and also a particular occasion for this duty, arising from that which God is about to do. Such an exhortation is always suitable, but it is especially so at these times, when the appearances arrive of God's displeasure, being poured out against a people and against a kingdom. And when a nation's cup of guilt is so filled up to the brim as to be ready to run over. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers. Three views may be taken of this word. One agreeing with the text in Matthew. And thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, etc. And again, it may also be understood in the sense of the passage read in from Exodus, which tells of the blood being sprinkled on the posts and, and the lentils of the doors, and also in the light of those passages speak of God as a hiding place. He shall hide them in the secret of his presence. These views, however, express the same thing. Entering into the, the closet is only useful insofar as we enter thereby into the secret of God's pavilion. And it is only by entering into the secret of God's pavilion that his people can ever be safe from their enemies. Now, when do we enter into the secret of God's pavilion? How do we enter there? We come to the holy God as to one who is a spirit possessed of infinite perfections, the just, true, and gracious God. His presence is called the holiest of all. This expression denotes perhaps, the nearest possible approach to God. How do we come to him? By the blood of the covenant and with all boldness. Now I fear we often think that we can come without this blood or rather without any deep sense of our need of it. But what is the reason of that? Simply that some of us do not know God at all and that we never yet have discovered either our enmity to God or God's contrariety to us. Now, beloved friends, the very first effect which the knowledge of God has upon a man is to make him feel that he is full of enmity to God and that therefore he cannot and dare not come to God. He trembles at the very mention of his name. He never can hear it with joy until he has been sprinkled by the blood. This approach by Christ's blood is clearly shown forth in the Passover. The blood on the lentil kept the destroying angel out. This is just a picture of the covenant of grace. Sprinkled with this blood, we can draw near to God. It is not natural to fallen man to come near in this way. And it is only when sin is weakened within us that we can do so. But when God, by his spirit, draws us, then we come by this way and have boldness to enter into the holiest of all. But we then remember, that makes us humble. No soul that ever entered there remained proud, either towards God or man. And this just belies the approaches to God that some people say they make. If they find it a natural and easy thing to come into the secret of His presence, if they find 
that their nature goes quite along with it. And they can enter there at all times without difficulty. This proves nothing but their ignorancy of God. The effect of the least knowledge of God's blessed perfection is to drive a man to the blood of Christ and to make him set a high value on that precious blood. Now, it is that this blood, having been applied afresh to the conscience, he becomes a poor, rebellious, God-dishonoring sinner to present on the altar his body and soul a living sacrifice. Again, when a believer goes into his closet, he requires to have this blood of sprinkling applied to his conscience. And that blood he presents to God. But before he can do this, the amity must be slain by the power of God's Spirit. And this is one of the tokens of God's eternal covenant with his Son, having been ratified, that the believer feels this within him as one of its glorious fruits. True, the amity is only so far slain. It is not yet extinct. Believers know this, and when we come into our closets, do we not often bring with us that awful distance of heart which dwells even in God's own people? It can never be destroyed while sin remains there in them. And it can only be subdued by the sprinkling of the blood of the Lamb. Now, if there are any present who never have known what enmity is, and who find it quite an easy matter to come before him in prayer at all times, what does this prove? That they are living near to God? It just proves this, that such people know nothing of God. It is when a man entering into his closet and from that to the secret place of God meets for the first time with him as a righteous God in Christ and when God at the same time meets with the sinner as a returning and believing child saying, Abba, Father, that the sinner is reconciled to God and united to the Savior. And what follows? Only the same thing again and again till his dying day. The duty of Christ's religion is in fact just this, that the believing sinner cannot help from day to day coming and coming always newly and yet always in the same way to his reconciled God and Father in Christ Jesus. We have dwelt on this because it is ever to this same daily duty of coming to himself in Christ that God directs men when he is about to call them to trial and suffering and would prepare them to endure such. This is the only preparation that a believer needs when days of persecution are at hand or when they actually arrive. It is not some new unheard of thing that they need, some new duty they are called to. Ah, uh, no. Blessed be God. Or if you call it new, it is only in this sense that it is to be performed with new zeal, with new strength, with new desires of attaining to the enjoyments of God. So that when he says to his people, come my people and enter thy chambers, he is just calling them to closer communion with himself, to more frequent coming to the blood of Christ before than before, that they may become more lively members of the living head. If we do not make this blessed use of communion with God, if we do not use God's perfections as a refuge and a hiding place, then the closet is useless to us. It must be a first step to the secret of God's presence. This has been the refuge of God's people in every age. I entreat you to cultivate secret prayer. Oh, seek never to enter the closet without giving into the presence of the Holy One to have dealings with the Lord God. Taste the sweetness of casting yourself by faith upon the perfections of God as reconciled in the cross for your only refuge. With Christ's sinless obediency as your covering in His sight. And it is just by obedience to this very command that every justified sinner is sanctified, prepared for a state of glory and perfected by degrees into complete conformity 
to the image of Emmanuel. Ah, oh, yes, beloved. And it is by this very process, humbling as it is, that you, believer, ought to be strengthened and emboldened and prepared for times of trial, of suffering, and of death. And in the day which is coming, a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, what will you need then when the cup of a nation's sin is filled up and when the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity? What will you need? Just what you have been needing all the while to be hidden in the secret place of the Most High God. If you wish in that day to be secure under the covert of your holy, holy, holy God from the storm of the Lord's anger, then you must much be in the Lord's presence. This must become more precious to you than it is. And then you will better understand the duty as well as the privilege of entering into your chamber and shutting the door until his indignation be overpassed. Alas, when times of trial come, many die away and fall back and are burned by the scorching rays of persecution just because they never got power to come to God and take refuge in him from all danger. But let us not forget to say that many who do come into the closet and who are God's children enter it and leave it just as they entered without ever so much as realizing the presence of God. And there are some believers who, even when they do obtain a blessing and get a little quickening of soul, leave the closet without seeking more, they go to their chamber and there get into the secret place. But then, as soon as they have got near to him, they think they have been peculiarly blessed and leave the chamber and go back into the world. Now this is calculated to draw us back again into sin. At least, by this we may lose many glorious advantages that we might otherwise gain over it. It is just by perseverance in prayer that we get the shelter we need. Fix your minds upon this, that in that day, what will constitute safety will not be the profession of godliness, though that be good in itself. Not zeal for Christ's cause. Not anything but the being hid in the secret of God in a more solemn, secret, personal, sensible union, or rather confirming of the union between them and Christ. We know that in such times many shall be blown away as the chaff, who were not so esteemed before. And the reason will be that they are not acquainted with the Holy God with whom they have to do. Beware, believers, of this. Try yourselves by this balance of the sanctuary, that you be not judged of the Lord. Oh, how is it that his own people have so little perseverance? How is it that when they do enter into their closets to be alone, they are so easily persuaded to return empty away. Instead of wrestling with God to pour out his spirit, they retire from the closet without the answer and submit it as being God's will. We must not let the evil deepen until we sink into a state of backsliding or make up our minds to bear it or withdraw to some believer and talk about it and then rest in a hope that we are living just because we seem to feel that we are dead. This is a melancholy view of the case. And yet, believer, can you not bear witness to its truth in your innermost conscience that there have been times when your complaining of deadness to others was a real comfort to yourself and a sort of satisfactory proof to you that you were really alive unto God? That is a husky, shallow religion which leads you to be always going to ministers to complain of your deadness instead of Talk, taking it to God and laying it all about you before the mercy seat, casting your dead soul before him, doing violency to your sloth, and wrestling humbly but earnestly till you find an entrance into his holy presence. Many are active enough in labor and try to do much for God as they think. But as to their prayers, where are they? 
few indeed and often dead enough. You go through them as a necessity, but they are soon over. But what does God say? This is the will of God, even your sanctification. That blessed work would advance more rapidly if, instead of laying the case before a friend or minister, you were rather keeping it to yourselves and laying at God's feet till you conquer in his strength and then contending with the pride which is growing out of the victory. I read lately, in the life of an eminent servant of God, an incident illustrative of this. He was in the ministry. And one day, two of his brethren came from a long distance to see him. To their surprise, he received them coldly and would scarcely speak to them. When they saw this, they took leave. And as they were going, instead of asking them to remain, he bade them farewell and saying, You will wonder at the reception you have met with today. But I have been two hours this morning seeking access to God and have not obtained it. And I have much need to be alone. This was one of the mighty wrestlers of a couple of centuries ago who stirred up themselves to lay hold on Jehovah's strength like the widow before the unjust judge, taking no denial but by the continual impaternity, getting power with God and prevailing. If you dwelt in his presence, you would be pressing forward to gaze on his holy perfections as so many chambers of safety for your souls. You would look on his power as your defense against the enemy. You would hide in his omnipotency. You would repose in his faithfulness. You would live upon his love and take refuge in his holiness made yours in Christ Jesus. Strange refuge this is for a guilty sinner. You would not be content with a mere knowledge about God. You would know him as I am that I am. You would hear a voice say, Come, my people, come and make my perfections your refuge and my presence your dwelling place. Make me your fortress, your buckler, your high tower. You would be fine studying his character as revealed in the sun, getting fresh discoveries of the glory of Christ, learning the worth of of the atoning blood and the depths of his unchanging love, daily crying out with him of old, wash thou me. And you would be daily going more out of self and into Emmanuel, in whom we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. No man who is a stranger to the fountain open for sin can be a Christian. No one who is a stranger to closet religion can be a Christian. No minister who is a stranger to the closet religion can be a Christian and should not be a leader. No one who is without communion with the living God can be a Christian. No man who is not forsaking every known sin can be a Christian. No man who refuses to discover to be sin that which God's Spirit and His Word has discovered to be Christ dishonoring can be a Christian. No Sin cannot live in the chambers of God's people. It cannot be carried into the secret of His presence. It cannot be indulged in in the holiest of all. Those who are holding their idols in their hearts and setting up their sins and stumbling blocks before their eyes are not Christians, but hollow professors and self-deceivers. Where will they be in a day of trial? When false refuge are wholly swept away, when all that is not hid in the secret of his pavilion shall be devoured by the overflowing scourge. Friends, when God's wrath shall sweep over every place but one, and that the secret of his own pavilion, what will you do then if you are not there? If you have not obeyed this invitation, come, my people. Enter into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. In application of this subject, we call upon all of you who are still strangers to God to believe that his scourge will soon sweep over this earth. Some of you think you can be safe at a distance without delighting him or communion with him. Fellow sinners, what will you feel at the day of judgment when you find yourself so far from God that when you call, he will not answer? 
because when he called, you would not hear, but tried to hide in the darkness of your own mind, in the darkness of a dead world, a deceitful devil, seeking comfort from prayerless ministers and leaders, and so remain a stranger to his love. Poor formalist, whether will you flee when you see him face to face? And you who are regarding iniquity in your heart, where will you turn to? Your forms and ceremonies, they won't screen you from that temptus. They will not make it break water to the billows of his wrath. Even the most scriptural and sound belief will be worthless to you if you have not made it your own. What would a mere good creed be at the day of judgment? The visible church will be no covert then. What avails the union of a dead member to a living body if it never was connected with the life-giving head? A profession will not shelter you from the glance of the eye of fire. You may profess Christ till death, as many have done before you, and never know his gospel as the power of God. You may rank among God's people. You may appear to belong to the sheep, even till the day when the sheep shall be separated from the goats, but no longer. You will be on the left hand then. You may pass for Christians among Christians, among men, even under the eye of the ministers. You may pass for such before the session, the elders may add your name to the communion roll. Yes, sadly though, this may seem. And it is too often the case that men's hypocrisy eludes the eye of ministers, of elders, and of God's own people. And yet, they are hypocrites still. Have you met with God who is light and in whom is no darkness at all? Have you met with God through the sprinkling of the blood? Is his Holy Spirit within you getting the mastery over sin and the victory over temptation? Or are you cleaving to that which he is urging you or once urged you to cast away even after you had promised as in the sight of God to forsake it? Yes, you shun the light lest your deeds be made manifest while you make a fair show before men cleaving to your sin in your heart and yet coming to the people of God and to the ministers of God and, and asking concerning him. Truly, you will have a fearful end. For God says of such that every one that separateth himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts the stumbling block of iniquity before his face and comes to the prophet to inquire of him concerning me or in our case, ministers. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man or woman. And will make him or her a sign and a proverb. And I will cut him or her off from the midst of my people. And you shall know that I am the Lord. That promise is found in Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 7 and 8. Not union with a visible church. Not a profession of godliness. Not a form of religion. Not prayers and fastings. Not good works. Not even putting on the collar of a minister. Not tears and repentancy. Will save the soul in the day when earth shall disclose her dead and shall no more cover her slain. Nothing less than the shelter of Christ's blood in the secret place of Jehovah, the pavilion of him who is almighty, will cover the sinner then. But blessed be God, though judgment may overtake us in a false security and surprise us in an imagined faith with a hypocrite's hope, it cannot follow us to or overtake us in the secret of God's pavilion. Ah, the roaring lion cannot come under that shade. He cannot find you there, feeble believer. Death and hell cannot shoot their arrows within the veil. The law cannot bring its summons into the holiest of all, nor the avenger of blood pursue. But, and why? Because it is sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. Death will soon be here. Since last we met, many, many have been summoned to the bar of judgment and have got their sentence sealed. 
and we wait to hear the voice that is to call us to himself. Not knowing when we may again be permitted to entreat you to return to God, we would the more urgently plead with you to be reconciled to him now by his son. Are you dealing with the blood of Christ? Do you only make use of it to keep you at a distance from God, or, as some do, to despise him and his law altogether? If so, you have never had it applied to you at all. Never. Christ's blood avails nothing except insofar as it brings you near to the Father of your spirits. Christ's blood is just a holy path to a holy nature. We would address a word of caution to God's people, and it is this. Always seek in religion to feel and realize more than you express to others. Do not dwell on past experiences as it were to comfort yourselves in the want of present grace, or speak of experiences to others when the grace is almost gone. Ah, beloved, if this be a snare to any of you, you have...